When we left off, our protagonist Omar had just had, and lost, a battle with jihadis. His peaceful Islam proved no match for true Islam. As he awakens, he quickly finds his dreams of a better life are crushed. He slowly descends to find what remains of his Bible verses, the proof of Muhammad's prophethood he had been gathering. There's nothing there. He desperately scours the scene, hoping to find any hint that Islam is true. Zara, where are you? He cries. His wife has gone too, taken as a sex slave by the jihadis. All seems lost. What is a reasonable, moderate Muslim to do? Then, suddenly, he sees a ray of hope. What is that? Did a Bible verse survive the corruption? Taking a closer look, he sees Deuteronomy 18.18. 18. Don't worry, little verse. I'll make you about Muhammad whatever it takes. No amount of context or common sense could make me doubt you. I won't even be dissuaded if the surrounding verses directly condemn Muhammad. Despite his words, deep inside, Omar's confidence is low. He must now seek out Muslim apologists who will tell him the lies he wants to hear and make him believe his imaginary God just might be real after all. The way forward is clear, but the road is fraught with pitfalls. Perhaps he'll meet a Christian who properly exegetes the text. Or maybe he'll encounter the greatest danger Islam has ever faced, a fish thinking for himself. Will Omar's faith survive? Stay tuned to find out. So last week we talked about a lot of things, and audience, if you were here last week, I do want you to uh, to also be thinking about some of the things that we covered, the verse at hand that uh, we are using, which is um, Quran chapter 7, verse 157. And I'm also going to ask Thaddeus to give us a little bit of a rundown, but I do want to hear from the audience as well some of the takeaways from last week's conversation. And as you guys are writing in your responses, I'm going to have Thaddeus give us a little bit of a rundown on what conclusions and what topics we covered in our last episode, the introduction to why it's so important to find Muhammad in our scriptures. Yes, absolutely. So we looked at chiefly Quran uh, 7157, which declares that the Jews and Christians will easily recognize Muhammad written in their own scriptures. And it gives this as a kind of uh, warning to the to the Jews and Christians that you know you you recognize Muhammad as a prophet and you're not following him. Um, so they have to be able to recognize him. You know they have to look to the scriptures that they had available. Um, if all is given this warning and the scriptures scriptures have already been corrupted, then he is pretty incompetent for making that uh, declaration. If on the other hand. Uh, it is in the scriptures, supposed to be in the scriptures they have. Well, we know what those are because we have manuscripts from the 7th century and we have manuscripts from before that time and they match what's in our modern Bible. So this means that Muslims have to find clear evidence that Jews and Christians would accept as a picture of Muhammad in the Bible. Um, if they don't, that means that they're one of two things. Either their scripture is lying, or the author of their scripture was too incompetent to realize that what he was saying isn't true. Either way, that doesn't look like a god to me. So if Muslims want to stay Muslim, they have to find Muhammad in the Bible, which is, of course, why they make these attempts. Um, we haven't looked at any specific arguments yet. We'll start doing that this week. And who knows? Maybe we'll say, yeah, that does actually kind of sound like Muhammad. Mm -hmm. there, there's one verse in mind that they quote that I think, you know, kind of actually does sound like Muhammad. Um, we'll get to that in a later week. But this week we'll be looking at Deuteronomy 18.18, 18, which is probably 
the most popular place uh, for Muslims to look. And to their credit, this passage at least is a prophecy about a coming prophet. Most of the things they point to have nothing to do with a claimed prophet. They're just passages that vaguely speak of Arabia, so they, they say they're about Muhammad, or they're passages that have a word that sounds like Muhammad, so they say that must be Muhammad, or they're passages that are clearly about something different. Um, so that's kind of where we stand so far. Yeah, that's good. I don't know if you got any audience participation in this just yet, um, but you did you did mention a couple of things that would be about the author of the Quran, right? Either he was ignorant and he didn't know that Muhammad was going to be in the scriptures, um, or he was too weak to maintain the scriptures that had descriptions about Muhammad. Uh, but the third one I think you missed, Thaddeus, I don't know if the audience caught it or not, was uh, that Allah himself changed the mm. the our scriptures so that they that muslims and christians and jews could not find muhammad in the scriptures so we've got ignorant um we have impotent and we have malicious as really the three options right so what happens if we do find muhammad in the scriptures well the, that's that's a great question if we find muhammad in the scriptures what it ends up doing is affirming our scriptures as being true and then on their face our scriptures completely contradict in key theological ways the assertions of the quran right so even if we find muhammad the quran is wrong if we don't find muhammad pretty obvious the Quran is wrong, and then the likely conclusions that come from that are all is a false god, Muhammad's a false prophet, either because they are malicious, impotent, or ignorant. And in no way, shape, or form is there a winning solution for Muslims, especially when they start to use those fallback arguments. Before I move on, Thaddeus, did you select any? Yeah, we got a couple from of comments um, from D here. Anthony Rogers just did a stream the other day about this mm -hmm. passage. And Tovia Singer, who is, of course, every Muslim's favorite Jew, uh, highly yes. recommend that stream. I have not seen that, yeah. but uh, Anthony always does great material, so I can recommend it without even seeing it. Uh, I Lydia's. did actually watch it last night live, and I rewatched it um, today. And he did he did a fan fantastic job. So um, clearly, you and I are not as theologically sound as him. However, we do have a lot of the same points, and because we're doing a little bit more precise way, I think we're going to add a, a few more points as well. So anybody uh, would be well to go watch that stream also it was a fantastic fantastic stream and he had technical difficulties too by the way he thought he had his microphone plugged in but he didn't so that was pretty funny good to know it's not just us uh so and not just us yeah litigus uh says muhammad should be, have just added verses to the bible like joseph smith did but he mm -hmm. couldn't read or write and i think if you look <laughs> at the the actual author of the quran i think they thought they were teaching the same message as what the Bible mm -hmm. teaches. They affirm it over and over again. However, they didn't actually really know what was in the Bible. They only had vague ideas from hearing oral stories. And mm -hmm. so they ended up completely contradicting it. Yep, which, which leads one to wonder if the author of the Quran is really the, an all-knowing God or if it was really an ignorant 7th century caravan trader who heard stories from people. One never really quite knows. Um, any more, any more comments, Thaddeus, yep, before we move uh, on? Yep, a couple more. Yep. Um, D also said, it pointed out that we said last week that this is an objective test, but it, it's mm -hmm. not just, oh, I see Muhammad, you know, from the Muslim perspective. It, right. That Because that can be re said regardless. There has to be some mm -hmm. actual evidence that a non-Muslim would accept. Correct. Yep. So many people hold false beliefs. I remember I had a slide about that last week. So a lot of people do hold false beliefs, but just because I'm convinced of a false belief doesn't make it any more true than it factually is false. So this is one of those things that an unexamined belief is not worth having. So 
it's I have no doubt that Muslims are convicted and convinced that they have found Muhammad in our scriptures. But in order for them to maintain and strengthen their belief, it does need to be held up to questions and examination, like exactly what we're doing, so that they can justify and verify their beliefs or that they can be justified in falsifying and disbelieving what it is that they believe, which requires humility. And this is one of the most key and one of the most important factors into this. If somebody's watching this, they need to be willing to lay aside their own presuppositions. They need to approach the subject um, with as unbiased a mind and a heart as possible in order to reach true factual conclusions as opposed to just um, you know, using their cognitive bias and ignoring things that don't make sense uh, and only listening to things that do make sense. Um, so one of the quotes we also used from last week was, um, if the Bible is is reliable enough to verify Muhammad as a prophet, then the Bible is also reliable enough to falsify Muhammad as a prophet. That's that's the little dilemma that Muslims find themselves in when they get into this finding Muhammad in the scriptures argument. Uh, the Great Commission mentioned Isaiah 42. <clears throat> Don't worry, we'll get to that in a later week. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Deuteronomy 18 is the classic most popular passage, but these days a lot of Muslims go to Isaiah 42. Definitely a close second, if not even the most popular nowadays, mm -hmm. so we'll definitely do that one in a future week. But we're going to kind of take them in the order they're in the Bible, so we start with yep. Deuteronomy. Yep, so we are taking this systematically. Like he said, we're starting chronologically from the beginning of the Bible uh, through the end of the Bible, so each and every single Muslim claim, whether it be from uh, an ancient uh, commenter on the scriptures or whether it be pop level Muslim things, we're going to try to attack and we're going to try to examine every single claim that Muslims make. So stay tuned for that. Absolutely. So that's all the comments from the audience for now. Uh, thank you for this. And all right, we can start on our look. Okay, so spoiler alert. If you don't want to know how this is going to go, then don't pay attention to the next 30 to 60 seconds, right? So this is this this is kind of the breakdown of how this is going to happen. So we discover almost immediately that Muhammad couldn't possibly be the prophet like Moses. After we immediately disqualify him, we will then continue to debunk that he could be the prophet from any possible conceivable way that the Muslims have forwarded. And in fact, we will prove that using the passage the Muslims have gone to, that the passage condemns Muhammad. And then finally, at the end of all of this, we will use the passage the Muslims have sent us to, to give them a real hope into a real prophet um, for real salvation. So let's go ahead and start with the general uh, prophecy or what, what they go to, Deuteronomy 18, 18. It goes like this. I will raise up a prophet for them from among their countrymen like you, and I will place words into his mouth, and he shall speak to them everything that I have commanded them. Now, you will see that I highlighted countrymen. A lot of times this is also translated in different translations, brethren or brothers right so a key criteria that the muslims are going to use is trying to prove and affirm that uh muhammad is in the literal line of the israelites right so they're going to say that muhammad is a brother to the Israelites. We're going to dive really deeply into that, but I'm going to give you a brief synopsis of what they mean. Muslims believe that Muhammad is a descendant of Ishmael. Like I said, we're going to get deeper into whether or not he is. And they believe that because he is a descendant of Ishmael, that he can be qualified as a brother to the Israelites. So, from the semantic word, from the Hebrew definition of the word that is used that I highlighted, which was countrymen or brethren, we can read uh, one through E different understandings of what the word could possibly mean. Um, so it could be 1A, brother of a separate parent, half brother, relative, kin, uh, each to the other, which is like a reciprocal relationship or figuratively uh, in terms of resemblance. So those are the arguments that Muslims are going to be working with. 
So the question we're going to ask and the questions that we are going to answer is, is Muhammad a brethren to the Israelites or a countryman to the Israelites? So 1A, we're going to eat each one of these by itself, a brother of the same parents. Clearly, Muhammad is not a member of Israel or Jacob's immediate family. He is not a bloodline descendant from the Jewish tribe. He is not neither a half-brother this is 1B. Muhammad is not a descendant uh, from the brother or half-brother of Israel or Jacob. Now we can start to get into some gray area discussions here. 1C, this is where Muslims need to go in order to make their argument that Muhammad could possibly be a considered a brethren to the Israelites, a relative or a kinship or someone of the same tribe so the question that we have to answer is muhammad a descendant from any relative is he a, a kin or a tribe to israel is muhammad descended from a reciprocal relationship with israel or does muhammad somehow resemble an israelite in some way form or fashion right the last three you can make an argument for the first two clearly muhammad is not either one of those things so like I said, they're going to claim that Muhammad is an Ishmaelite. And they're going to claim <clears throat> that because he is an Ishmaelite, that puts him in the general category of being a relative to Jacob. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. So let's just start out with this little statement. Claims without evidence can be dismissed without evidence. A Muslim can come up, can come up to you and say, well, Muhammad was an Ishmaelite. And you get, okay, what is the evidence for Muhammad being a descendant of an Ishmaelite? They're going to give you some weak inferences, which we will get more into, uh, especially in the Isaiah type of passages. Uh, they're going to give you in things like the Caterites, and they're going to say, um, you know, the Arabs and all those types of things, meaning that uh, Muhammad comes from that general line. Um, and then we'll discover here in a little bit how uh, Muslim scholars have tried to trace the lineage from Muhammad back to Ishmael. And the best they can do is trace his lineage back to a person named Adnan, who, guess what, is not traceable to being an Ishmaelite, right? So they have a weak inference with their argument, which means they have weak evidence for their argument. And since they have basically no evidence for the argument, we can dismiss their argument full stop. Before but you go how further... Do I, I yeah, want to make ahead, a comment brother. there that actually that that relation to Adnan is interesting because this is, is a common pattern in the history of Islam mm -hmm. that the the early Muslims don't seem to know much and you know they only can trace him back I, I don't I think it's like six generations or something getting mm -hmm. nowhere near the time they need to to relate him to Isaac or Ishmael or anyone else and then over time suddenly more information comes to light that, <laughs> that when muslims centuries later are trying to prove their case oh yeah we know that that muhammad is related so you can find a genealogy that supposedly ties him back to ishmael but that comes several centuries after the time of muhammad and Correct. you have to ask is this from people in a position to know especially since earlier generations didn't know this information or is it more likely that someone just made this up yeah just making up a list of names it actually kind of reminds me a little bit of the miracle claims of muhammad right we all know that the quran explicitly says that muhammad came with no miracles he will perform no miracles but as we see later generations of muslims with the hadith collections 200 years later a thousand kilometers away, um, they start to come up with all of these incredible miracles that Muhammad supposedly did. It's pretty similar in the fact that it's like, why are why did early Muslims not say, no, oh, he's clearly an Ishmaelite, or why did early Muslims not immediately claim that they witnessed miracles? And even still, why did the Quran say uh, that Muhammad would come with no miracles when Muslims 200 years later would basically live and die by the fact that Muhammad performed miracles. It, it makes exactly no sense to me. All right. So assuming assumptions are absolutely accurate, and this is what we're going to have to do for the rest of, of today, we will test the passage and see 
if it might still fit Muhammad, assuming he is, in fact, a relative in the general sense that he could potentially maybe almost be a brethren to the Israelites. Again, we're going to read the passage, Deuteronomy 18, 18. It says, I, and I highlighted the important speaker here, I will raise up a prophet for them from among their countrymen like you, and I will place my words into his mouth, and he shall speak uh, to them everything that I have commanded him. Audience question time, Thaddeus question time. When he says, I, when the speaker of this verse in Deuteronomy 18, 18 says, I, who is the speaker? If you want to pull up something uh, from the audience here, Thaddeus, please go ahead. Or if you might p potentially know who I is, I'd like to hear from you as well. Well, of course, they're go they're a little bit behind us, you know, 15, 20 seconds behind yeah, us. I tried to, I, I tried to talk long enough to, to get us to that, but yeah. So I'll just go ahead and and then of course it take time to type it in as well. I'm sure most of the audience mm -hmm. uh, have the answer on the tip of their tongues and they're just trying to type it in real fast. But I'll go ahead and answer for them that this would be God, who the text identifies as Yahweh. You mm -hmm. already said that we had to give the Muslims one assumption. I, I think maybe we should keep track of how many assumptions we have to give them to keep this. Mm -hmm. text this going oh, there you go uh yeah. litigus says i is god god yeah and but villainous, specifically right because yeah go ahead sorry and villainous said the big boy which <laughs> i'm gonna say is presumably also <laughs> referring to god um but yes the text explicitly identifies who god is you know he mm -hmm. has a name and that name is yahweh right so when you go back to the Hebrew text, you will see the tetragrammatron as who is being the speaker, who is the I. When you read this into context, um, if I, I use the, especially for the Old Testament, I'll use the LEB uh, Bible because it just says Yahweh wherever it says says Yahweh. I know for some people it's, you know, they, they don't want to say the name of God, um, but the LEB Bible makes it very clear. So if you do want an English translation, uh, and I'm sure there are others out there that actually just say when the, when the Hebrew says Yahweh, they, it just says Yahweh so that we're not confused about it, right? Because sometimes uh, when you just read Lord in all caps, right, that's that's when they're using the divine name. Um, but it just makes it easier when you read the LEB, right? So, yes. Yeah, the before I before you go passage, on, I did want to give yeah. uh, credit here. Mojo Dude said the answer is the covenant name of the God mm. of Abraham. See, he Correct. typed all those words, so he was slower <laughs> in giving the I response. Understand. But I think that the uh, the cookie still goes to him for the best answer. All right. Congratulations. <laughs> you get a cookie. Um, right. So you guys got it right. Thaddeus, you got it right. And clearly when you read the context, especially with the Hebrew, the I speaking in this passage is Yahweh. So this leads us to a question. If this is possibly about Muhammad, the question we ask is, did Muhammad speak and deliver revelations in God's covenant name, Yahweh? Thaddeus, did he? He did not. Okay. So immediately that disqualifies him. Immediately that is disqualifying to Muhammad because he did not deliver a revelation in the name of Yahweh. Plain and simple. If you're having a discussion with a Muslim, this is one particular way you can debunk their argument immediately immediately disqualifies him okay now even if the assumed assumptions are absolutely accurate like i said uh muhammad is disqualified so even if he was an ishmaelite still he didn't speak a name or he did not deliver uh, a revelation in the name of yahweh that's pretty pretty simple what kind of what kind of response when we bring this up do we get from from muslim status i'm kind of showing it here on the screen but what what do you typically hear if it's not just what's here on the screen well you, you know you say I, that to them you shouldn't have put the screen up because i was going to say that exact thing they'll, they'll it's say gone. <laughs> <laughs> they'll say uh well jesus didn't speak uh, the name yahweh therefore none of the prophets did therefore muhammad's still a prophet something along those lines. right Exactly, right. So that's that's just known as the two quoque fallacy. It says like basically, well, we have the problem, we admit it, we're wrong, but so do you, so don't bring it up to us, right? And and, and that's the that's the essential Muslim 
way of going around particular subjects. If you ever get a Muslim cornered or they get into a position where they're not quite sure of the answer, instead of them saying, I don't know the answer, they immediately flip it. The Bible is corrupted. The Trinity makes no sense. How can God die? Those types of questions are what we get from Muslims. They just flip it right around and they say, you two have the same problem. These are red herrings. These are straw men. And these are two quote fallacies, which we've talked about in some, some previous streams here. So exactly like what you said, show me where Jesus speaks or delivers a revelation in the name of Yahweh. Now, even if Jesus never delivered a message in the name of Yahweh, and it proves that Jesus was not a prophet, A, that disproves Islam because Islam believes that Jesus was the Messiah of Yahweh and was a prophet, um, that disqualifies uh, just because Jesus has been disqualified and therefore disqualified them. It also just disqualifies Muhammad on his face as well. So we could both have the same problem and we could both be wrong. Right, but the burden of proof is not on us. We do not need to answer these types of, of objections. But because we're Christians, we turn the other cheek. We go the extra mile. Um, we will go ahead and answer the question on whether or not Jesus uh, gave revelation in the name of Yahweh. First and foremost, pretty simple. Jesus' name, uh, Yeshua, in the Hebrew is Yahweh is salvation. That's what it means. The name of God is actually Yahweh in within jesus own name so first and foremost clearly he came in the name of yahweh since he is named yahweh is salvation but we can take it a step further we can read the scriptures in which jesus is speaking we're going to go specifically to the scene where uh the holy spirit leads jesus into the desert right to have him fast for 40 days and 40 nights and have the devil attempt to tempt him uh, these are some of the responses that Jesus gives to Satan. He makes reference to previous scriptures. So this is what it says in the New Testament here on the left. No, says Jesus, the scriptures say, people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Right? So the the New Testament is written in what language, Thaddeus? Greek. Greek. Okay. So I wouldn't expect to see... A Hebrew word here but what Jesus is quoting is he's quoting a passage from Deuteronomy and we can see specifically what he was quoting Deuteronomy I think this is six or eight I'm sorry I didn't didn't put it on my note and uh, it basically I'll just read the end of it is you know that not by bread alone but by all that goes out of the mouth of Yahweh again using the LEB Bible this he uses the word Yahweh, man does not live by bread alone, but from the words that come out of the mouth of God or the mouth of Yahweh. So Jesus is using scripture that pronounces Yahweh. We see the same thing with the second temptation. The scriptures also say, you must not test the Lord your God. Here he's quoting again from Deuteronomy. You shall not put Yahweh your God to the test as you tested him at Manasseh. So we see in two examples so far that Jesus is using the divine name when he is responding to uh, Satan. Jesus then finally, after the third, the third temptation, says, Get out of here, Satan, for the scriptures say you must worship the Lord. Again, all caps, you'll see this over in the Greek, or sorry, in the Hebrew, your God, and serve him only. Again, this is from Deuteronomy. You shall fear Yahweh your God, or in Greek, Kyrios, your, uh, I don't know what exactly what they use for God, Theon, um, and you shall serve him, and by his name you shall swear. Again, Jesus is using previous Hebrew scriptures, right, to defend himself uh, against the devil's temptations. He is using the Tetragrammatron. He is using the divine name of God, and he himself is in, within his name, uses the divine name of God. So that's a little sideways track, but I want to walk that extra mile with Muslims so that when they bring up this two quoque fallacy, we can actually defeat it on its face. So now, moving on, I'm going to, to back us up here a little bit back to the verse. All right, so one of the things that Yahweh is going to do is he's going to place words into this prophet's mouth, and he shall speak to them everything that I command him. So the question is that we're going to have to ask, 
is did Muhammad speak only in everything that he was commanded to speak? Now, Thaddeus, I know we, we talked a little bit about you you taking over this particular thing. Um, if you're prepared to do so, go ahead. If not, I can go ahead and tackle it. Uh, but briefly, there are uh, numerous, I think upwards of 50 different uh, independent sources from Muslims themselves that say that Muhammad did in fact accidentally reveal words from Satan as if they were the Quran, right? If this is true, that is very problematic because that means that he did not speak the words of even his Allah God, let alone the words of Yahweh. He also denied his all a given desire, right? for his adopted son's wife, whom he saw scantily clothed and had his heart leap for, named Zainab. He denied that he wanted to marry her. He, he told uh, his adopted son that he did not want him to divorce her. And yet, that goes against what Allah commanded him to do. Allah said, no, 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 you're wrong. You need to marry her. And the same thing, uh, same type of thing happened when he was caught sleeping with one of his slave girls and his and he swore to his wives that he wasn't going to do it again and Allah once again said oh by the way you need to do that because I want you to do that uh, but go ahead Thaddeus and, and expand upon these different things if you would like yeah uh, so I guess we'll just kind of take them in order here starting with the satanic verses this is probably the most popular Christian response um, saying that if you just read a couple verses further in Deuteronomy, chapter 18, it says, Anyone who speaks in the name of another god or falsely speaks in my name, something I did not tell him to say, is a false prophet and uh, should be stoned to death. Mm -hmm. So, uh, most of the audience is probably fairly familiar with the, the basic story here, but we'll go ahead and give a brief outline anyway. So Muhammad uh, wasn't doing so well early in his career. He wasn't convincing very many people to start following him. And in particular, his own tribe, his closest relatives, he was not really reaching. So he longed for this, this revelation that would fix that problem. He longed for a revelation that would give something to his tribe's people to make it easier for them to convert to Islam. And lo and behold, he got that revelation. A common pattern that he got revelations that fulfilled his desires, in this case not a particular selfish one. He got a revelation that said that Alat, Aluza, and Manat, three pagan three of the most popular pagan goddesses, were exalted cranes that would carry your prayers to Allah, basically saying that they were valid to pray to. Or, and in other words, that uh, Islam is at least partially polytheistic. There might be one supreme god, but there are other gods that are valid to pray to. Mm -hmm. uh, the crowd was overjoyed. They, they bowed down in... in honor of this revelation, like, finally, something we can agree with. And his closest followers, those who had also conver already converted to Islam, they also bowed down. And Muhammad himself bowed down in honor of this revelation. Oops. Then uh, a couple years later, this is the part that is not often emphasized, but it wasn't like the next day. It was a couple years later, he realized that Oops, this revelation wasn't really from Allah. This revelation mm. had come from, according to Muhammad, Satan. Satan had tricked him into giving this revelation. And his defense was, uh, he was worried about this. And surprise, surprise, Gabriel came to him, or I should say Jabril came to him and said, Don't worry, this happens to all the prophets. There isn't any prophet who wasn't tricked by Satan. Now... The Muslim can't attempt a to quote quay fallacy here because there is no record of any other prophet <laughs> at any point being tricked by Satan. So, mm. big problem there. He not only thought, said there was three other gods that were worthy of worship, he was tricked by 
the devil. In my opinion, pretty clear indication that he was not under any kind of divine protection. And he gave these words as if they were part of the Quran, as if they were Allah's speech. In other words, mm -hmm. if we're granting the assumption that Allah is the same God as in the Bible, he gave mm -hmm. a revelation in the name of Allah that was not from God. And guess what? According to the very passage the Muslim has brought us to, that disqualifies mm -hmm. him. Anyone who speaks in the name of another God or speaks words that uh, are untrue, that didn't come from me, he's a false prophet. Exactly. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have you pause right there just for a second, Thaddeus, um, because when we originally started this series, I said there are a few falsifiable claims um, that, that we, can, we can test. And one of them was the, the claim to produce a surah like it, right? But one of the problems with that particular claim was it is a little bit of a subjective criteria. I could produce a surah in Arabic that I believe is beautiful, but a Muslim is going to hear it and go, no, that's not as beautiful as the Quran. You have failed to produce a surah like it because there's really no actual criteria for that particular verse. However, this does, if the satanic verses are true, which many, many sources would make us believe that it was, and it meets the criteria of embarrassment. Uh, if that's true, somebody did actually meet the surah like it, because the best understander and the best interpreter for the Quran is who, Thaddeus? Muhammad. Muhammad. And Muhammad received a revelation from Satan, correct, according to these, to these stories. Mm -hmm. And since he received a revelation from Satan, and he didn't recognize it as any of any different than Allah because he went on preaching this for years and he didn't realize it until Jabril comes to him and says, oh, by the way, that's the thing that you keep repeating. Uh, you got that from Satan. So to me, it seems pretty obvious within the Muslim view and paradigm that Satan himself actually met the criteria to be a, uh, to create a surah like a surah in the Quran, because in fact, he did create a surah in the Quran until it was abrogated and taken out. So, sorry, Muslims, that is a major issue for you as well. Yeah, I mean, it has multiple, multiple problems with that. But mm -hmm. in particular, for today's purpose, uh, you know, he's speaking words. He's saying these words in the name of Allah, and they're not coming from Allah, which means if Allah is the author of Deuteronomy 18.18, 18, then Muhammad's in big trouble. Yep. He, he has failed be. the test. Let's put it that way. All right. Well, thank you for that, sir. So we must continue to ignore these things. We must continue to ignore Muhammad's lineage issue, the Yahweh debacle. We must ignore their two quoque fallacies. And we must ignore the fact that Muhammad didn't actually fulfill what this verse says, which is speak uh, what Yahweh has told him to say. So we're going to just continue to ignore all of these things and we're going to do probably the most rational thing which is to read the verse itself in context on your screen i've highlighted a few key points that we will be going through so that um, you guys can understand it now yahweh it says yahweh your god will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your countrymen and I'm going to zoom in on my own thing here because I got my camera in the way. Um, from, wait, sorry. So Yahweh your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your countrymen. And he, and to him, you shall listen. This is according to all that you ask from Yahweh your God at Oreb. On the day of the assembly saying, I do not want again to hear the voice of Yahweh my God. And I do not want to see again this great fire so that I may not die. And Yahweh said to me, they are right in what they have said. I will raise up a prophet from, uh, for them from among their countrymen like you, and I will place my words into his mouth, and he shall speak to them everything that I have commanded him. And then that man that will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I will hold accountable. However, the prophet that behaves presumptuously by speaking a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak and who speaks in the name of other gods, then that prophet 
thank you, Thaddeus, for spoiling it for us. Sorry. Shall die. <laughs> and if no, it's all good, brother. And if you say to yourself, "How can we know the word of Yahweh has not spoke has not been spoken to him?" Whenever that prophet spoke in the name of Yahweh, and that the thing does not take place and does not come about, that is the thing that Yahweh has not spoken to him. Presumptuously, the prophet spoke, and you shall not fear that prophet. So, reading this in context, right, because they isolate it just to, to 1818. However, last week we talked about how Maldudi said that we need to be reading it from verse 15, which is good. That's kind of where the context starts, through 19. He, for whatever reason, that is, we, we talked about this a little bit. Why do you think he cut it off at 19 and didn't keep on reading through, oh, I don't know, 20? Why do you think he did that? Well... I don't think he could have read the passage and thought that that was the end of the thought because it continues mm -hmm. on with and. So mm -hmm. uh, I don't think that he could have done it for that reason. I think he must have done it for a different reason, perhaps because he didn't want to believe what verse 19 and following had to say. <laughs> uh, it's difficult, isn't it? So. Uh, you know, however, the prophet that pre behaves presumptuously, right? So Muhammad, we can demonstrate, behave presumptuously by speaking a word not in my name that I did not command him to speak in the name of other gods. What should happen to him again, Thaddeus? If, he if, if someone shall does that? die. <laughs> and if he gives a prophecy, but the prophecy doesn't come to pass, should you fear that prophet? No, because hmm. he's these not are some speaking... testable. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say, are, he's not speaking claims. on... Uh, God's authority, so therefore the wrath of God is not on you for not following him. Yeah. Thaddeus, do you want to read this for us here? And then I know it's a little bit complicated, but I'm, I'm going to have you read it, and, and we're going to have you do a little bit of an exegesis for us. <laughs> All right. The speaker is Allah. Uh, never mind, the speaker is Yahweh. Right. So we're exegeting the passage. This is who is speaking. Yes. The listener is the Ishmaelites. No, no, it's the Israelites. Sorry, I, I mm -hmm. misread that. Specifically, the Ishmael Israelites who experienced the exodus among or in your midst. The prophets will speak all that uh, Yahweh commands them. <laughs> the prophet will not speak in the name anyone besides we don't even have to cross out a law here. I mean, Muhammad spoke in the name besides Allah. <laughs> <laughs> right. And if a prophet speaks in the name of anyone besides Allah, no, nope, Yahweh, they shall die. All right. So that is the, the exegesis, right? So this is the proper exegesis. I know I put in those little cross mark things as, as a little bit of a joke. And the reason why I put them in there is because that is how a Muslim would actually have to read the passage, right? That's called eisegesis. They're reading in their uh, assumptions and presuppositions into the text to try to force Muhammad into this particular scripture. I put the cross marks on there because this is what the scripture is actually saying, and it disqualifies Muhammad as being a prophet like Moses from the word go, all right? So using that, that proper exegesis, we can jump into the final thing that we have yet to disprove, which is to speak a a false prophecy. So let's just say that Muhammad spoke 99 true prophecies. Let's say he gave 99 prophecies that came to pass, right? Their Muslims are going to be hard pressed and they got to do quite a bit of backbending to, to really even prove one. But that's not even the criteria. The bar is set in this passage. If that prophet speaks in my name and the prophecy does not come to pass, you shall not fear that prophet. So here in Sahih Muslim, so if you're a Sunni Muslim, Sahih Muslim's as good as it gets. Book 41, number 750, Aisha reported that when the desert Arabs came to Allah's messenger, they asked about the last hour as to when that would come. And he looked toward the youngest amongst them and he said, if he lives, he would not grow very old that he would find your last hour coming to you and he would see you dying. What does that mean, Thaddeus? Uh, well, 
we'll we'll say what it properly means first, and then we'll come up. Then we'll address the Muslim excuse after that. <laughs> okay. But properly, okay. what it's saying is Muhammad saying, "I don't know how long this boy is going to live, but mm -hmm. the end of the world's coming within his lifetime and within his youth, even." Um, mm -hmm. Even if we, you know, very old, that's subjective. Well, let's just ignore that part entirely and just say it has to be sometime in his lifetime. And let's yep. say that this this boy was one year old and he lived to be 120, tied the record for longest lived. That's the end of the world in the next 119 years. Mm -hmm. It's a bit more than 119 years since Muhammad gave yep. this prophecy. That's That's a bit of an issue, isn't it, right? So if the last day did not come within that boy's lifetime or even you know let's let's grant a couple hundred years you know uh, or unless thaddeus maybe this dude's still alive you ever <laughs> think about that because the muslims do believe in the seven sleepers and they can fall asleep for hundreds of years before they are awakened maybe that is one particular excuse they can come up with but if this boy is not still alive to this day or if somehow the the last hour came and we're all here some other way form or fashion then this prophecy did not come to pass now did you want to give us a different well yeah i was standard? gonna say that would actually be a better defense um mm -hmm. i i've not heard a muslim offer that again christians come up with better better arguments for muslims <laughs> yeah, than that they was offer on the fly themselves. brother i just came over that right now <laughs> <laughs> but yeah maybe maybe miraculously this boy is not very old yet and then he he's growing very slowly and he's only Ten, the equivalent of 10 years old or something. Um, mm -hmm. But ignoring that miraculous possibility, what, what Muslims usually say is, well, the boy died in his youth. Therefore, he didn't live. Therefore, you can't go to the second part of that verse. <laughs> <laughs> I see. I see what they did there. All right. Playing some um, word games, basically, because yeah, that's yep. clearly not what the verse... The verse is is phrased in such a way that it doesn't matter if he lives or not. And then they try to say, well, he died, so it doesn't count. Right. If he lived, yeah, exactly. So regardless of how you do it, if the boy lives this long, a normal lifetime, the end would be there. And if he dies young, well, we would just assume that it would be until the end of his life when the, when the last hour would come. Uh, that's a really bad argument. I actually like my argument better. Muslims, if you're trying to make an argument for this passage, consider what I just said. You might be able to, you know, it's so unfalsifiable that, uh, you know, you can go ahead and believe your nonsense. We won't, but at least you can talk amongst yourselves. And, I mean, there, can, there's plenty of Muslims believe. that will tell you that the wall of Dulkarnain is just some mm -hmm. undiscovered place on the earth and it's really holding back people that have been living there for thousands of years because yeah. as uh, Allah has miraculously sustained these people because oh wait that was another prophecy about the end times wasn't it <laughs> <laughs> wow what a coincidence yeah, there almost like now. Muhammad actually expected the end time soon yep yep yeah, we, we, we could probably do a whole stream on the different uh, end time prophecies that uh, apparently happened by the time of that young boy's lifetime that he's still alive, but he's asleep. Um, but anyway, moving on, let's ignore some more facts. Right, I, I keep coming back to this, right, because I want to reiterate how many facts the Muslims do actually have to ignore in order to convince themselves at least i doubt they're convincing anybody else, but convince themselves that Muhammad is a prophet. So we've got to ignore the fact of the the lineage of muhammad the yahweh debacle the two kokwe fallacies the presumptuous statements of muhammad the failed prophecies of muhammad and the fact that the uh ishmaelites were not amongst or within the midst of the hearers at horeb so we're going to go back to the brethren statement because i really do believe this is the about the strongest argument that they can make is muhammad a brother and then and then if he is then we can ignore all the rest of the stuff that we said we had to ignore and we can make an argument that it is potentially potentially right because at the beginning i gave the a b c d e different ways of understanding it and since ishmael although we can't officially link muhammad to ishmael we'll assume assumptions uh it, it is is a brother to the ishmaelites or some relative or to, to the israelites uh but anyway so with all that said let's let's go into the hebrew i don't speak hebrew i'm going to mispronounce this but eh right eh or something like that is how that is this is written as you can see on your screen on the left hand side that is the hebrew word 
for it, right? We're looking for a prophecy from Muhammad within the in the books of the Torah. Sorry, not from Muhammad. I please God forgive me. From Moses uh, within the first five books of the the Torah. This word in the exact form that it is used in Deuteronomy 18:18 18, 18, is used one other time, and that is used in Genesis 48:6. This is the scene where um, Joseph, or sorry, uh, Jacob, Israel, is blessing Joseph's boys, two boys, and he says by the names of their brothers in inheritance, right? So what we're talking about is descendant brothers, bloodline brothers, descended specifically from and through Jacob, who is known as Israel. So in this exact format and the other way that it's used, it is used explicitly to refer to 1A, which is the brothers or a bloodline descendant of Jacob. So let's play a game of semantics, right? So brother by Israel or Jacob's bloodline only. So if Muslims want to make this work, one way that they can do it is to say that, well, Muhammad is a Jew. So if Muslims want to say that Muhammad is a Jew, then then their argument can stick. They can say that he delivered messages and blah, 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 and we'll have to ignore all the facts that he was just a false Jewish prophet. But regardless, if Muslims want to maintain this within the semantic usage of the word for brothers and how uh, Moses applied it, then they can conclude and make an argument that he is a prophet like Moses and he is jewish and therefore you can't come up with any objections against us thaddeus do you think that any muslims are going to be willing to utilize that uh, uh i that, don't uh, think idea? any muslims going to offer that argument uh the irony okay. here is that there would be christians who would make that argument that muhammad was actually a failed mm -hmm. jewish prophet yeah yeah, I know a lot of the well, the sin sifters, I believe, is what they're called. A lot of those, a lot of those folks uh, have some different different understandings of who Muhammad was, and uh, they're, you know, what they're doing. Uh, they're making a stronger case for Muhammad being a prophet, like like Moses. But uh, anyhow, let's move on. But maybe, right? And I'm putting a stretch out here, Thaddeus. Maybe Muhammad is an Edomite possible right because the word for brethren although it's not in the exact format god does say that the edomites are the brothers of israel but let me ask you this why would why would he say that the edomites are brothers of israel thaddeus um i'm not quite sure where you're going okay all right so the edomites are descendants of who Edom. <laughs> Edom or Esau, right? <laughs> so Esau is the father of the Edomites. Okay. Who is I get Esau the twin now. brother of? So you see where I'm going with it now? Yeah, you're saying that they won't want to make this argument since, of course, Esau is cursed. Well, they can make that argument. I'm trying to help them out in any <laughs> way, shape, or form. So, so my point being is you should not abhor. So basically they're saying don't abhor your brothers. The Edomites, because I'm trying to make the argument for the Muslims that if if Muhammad is an Edomite, then perhaps, right, because Jacob, right, was renamed Israel and all his descendants are known as Israelites, and Esau has a nation named after him, which are all his descendants are the Edomites, then what we can start to conclude here is that it's okay to call the Edomites brothers because literally they're brothers of Jacob. They're brothers of each other. They're twin brothers with the same father and the same mother, and therefore they do have a similar bloodline. So if Muhammad wants to, or Muslims want to make an argument that Muhammad is an Edomite, which again, the sin sifters can actually start to make this argument, um, then maybe, maybe he is. Do you think they're going to want to be that though? You kind of already hinted at it. That yeah. they, they probably well, don't want to be Edomites either. Yeah, I don't... You know, um... It's, it's better than nothing, right? Uh, which is what mm -hmm. they have now. But I, I have a feeling it's not going to satisfy them because they, they right. want their prophet to be perfectly connected with no yeah. hint of contamination. And this is not going to be the right bloodline for that. Exactly. No, for sure. Right. So let's 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 try to figure this out. Right. So if the Edomites, right, because they're related to Israel, if they're called brothers, then perhaps... 
Ishmael, the Ishmaelites might be considered brothers of Jacob as well. But the issue is, if we're speaking strictly from family lineage, Ishmael, who's the brother of Isaac, right? And Isaac is the father of Jacob. That makes Ishmael an uncle to Jacob, right? Not a brother, but an uncle. Let's see if the Bible throughout the entire scripture, Old Testament, New Testament, heck, we'll go to Apocrypha, I don't care. Are the Ishmaelites referred to as brothers? The answer is no. They are referred to as brothers exactly zero times. So even from the semantic level of this, it makes anyone besides an Israelite or perhaps an Edomite impossible to be a prophet like Moses. Because from amongst the, their midst, the people who survived the Exodus, amongst their midst, are the one who the prophet has to come from. And Muhammad, according to the traditions of Muhammad's, which they, with of the Muslims, which they can't even verify anyway, was an, uh, an Ishmaelite. It's just all kinds of levels of impossible. So let's continue to ignore the facts. So although Muhammad has been disqualified several times over, Muslim Dawagandists will still make claims, right, Thaddeus? They're still going to keep going. This well, of course, as we covered last week, they don't have a choice. They have to make these claims because their religion is dependent on them. They can't right. just pretend that Muhammad... They can't just state the obvious fact, I should say, that mm -hmm. Muhammad's not in the Bible because their God claims he is. So they got to come mm -hmm. up with something. Right. So... Uh, but an honest and humble person watching this or listening to this or taking this information in, they have to start to come up with some serious questions on how it would be possible for Muhammad to be a prophet like Moses, right? We've, we've got one argument, right? Most Muslims never take you down that path if, if you're starting a discussion with them. What they start to try to do is just to bring up comparisons, right? Moses did this. Muhammad did the same thing. Moses did that. Muhammad did the same thing. And they don't take into consideration the context of the verse, what the verse is actually saying, what it requires, what a prophet like Moses is required to be. They just go straight to the most superficial levels possible. So although we could rightfully ignore that, we're going to be fair. We're going to be more than fair. We're going to hear them out. I found this on a Muslim website. It, I believe the Muslim website was Jesus is uh, Muslim dot com. <laughs> so here, here, here's the points of comparison, right? You can tell what's happening here because Moses is in blue and Muhammad is in blue. And because they're both in the same color category, uh, it means that they're they're the same. OK, we're going to talk about Jesus here in a little bit, but we're going to ignore that that bit of it. And we're, we're going to do points of comparison between Moses and Muhammad. Moses and Muhammad were both born naturally. They were both political leaders. Uh, nobody, both of them, nobody considered them to be God. They, did, they came with a new law. They both died naturally. They were both married and they both fought their enemies. So the, the only conclusion that we can come up with, given the three choices on the board, really two, because Moses is Moses, that the two choices is we know for sure that it's, it's Muhammad and couldn't possibly be Jesus. But there's a problem with this, isn't there, Thaddeus? It, only one? <laughs> Say what? I said only one. <laughs> only one problem? Well, let's let's talk about the false dichotomy first. What, what's what's the issue with that? Yeah, well, of course, uh, you know, the, I, I was joking. Uh, all of the problems would be related to this. That they've set it up that there's mm -hmm. only two possibilities. Either it refers to Jesus or it refers to Muhammad. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course, the, the vast majority of the world's population wouldn't agree with either of those, actually. Uh, you know, Jews would say that it, it is not about um, Jesus, for sure. And they certainly would say mm -hmm. it's not about Muhammad. Atheists mm -hmm. would say it's not about anything, and that you're just imagining stuff. Um, yep. You know, Buddhists wouldn't have an opinion, but they probably could not say that it's a valid prophecy. Uh, right. Same with Hindus. You know, they don't have any opinion mm -hmm. who it might be, but they'd say it probably isn't a prophecy of the future since your religion's not true. And right. then, of course, even if, the, you know, people, even if those are two claims that are made, uh, they both could be wrong. And 
the criteria they gave us were so arbitrary that just about hmm. every person who ever existed mm. fulfilled those. They t basically, mm. what they did is to say, here's the things that are very unique to Jesus. Moses didn't have those same attributes, therefore Muhammad's a prophet. <laughs> Correct, right. So, so you, you just nailed it on the head, right? They invented this criteria. This criteria is not from the verse itself. This criteria is not unique, right? So if it was a true dichotomy, what they would do is they, it would narrow it down to those two individuals themselves would be the only two possible people that might be able to fulfill this role. But that's not true, because if we just use that criteria that they used on this website, what do we come up with? <laughs> well, we come up with something pretty extraordinary. And we're going to go ahead and walk the extra mile with the Muslims, because I'm going to make an argument, Muslims, that Napoleon Bonaparte is actually the same category as Muhammad is as a prophet like Moses, according to their criteria. So if we can get Napoleon Bonaparte to be the prophet like Moses within their own criteria, I'm pretty sure that we don't want Muslims or we don't we, we can't take that as a meaningful criteria, right? Because Napoleon Thaddeus was born naturally. He was considered human. He was a political leader. He was married. He fought his enemies and he brought new laws. So given given that state of criteria, Napoleon is as much fit to be a prophet like Moses as Muhammad. So clearly this is the, the, the criteria used here, at least with this website, is completely meaningless, right? And I could probably come up with a dozen other people who did the same things, namely Joseph Smith, right? The founder of Mormonism. He, he, he would fit this category as well. And Joseph Smith might fit the category better because not only was he married to one person, he was married to multiple people. And he also received a revelation um, from from the yeah. angel that that told him things that don't align with the Bible at all. But at least, at least Joseph Smith did better than Muhammad because Mormons actually hold the Old Testament and the New Testament to some degree of authority. They just have added their Third Testament, which is like the Book of Mormon. So I would go so far as to say, if we're using this criteria, and I had to pick a quote unquote prophet to follow, I'd go with Joseph Smith, and I would not go with Muhammad. I don't know about you, Thaddeus. Yeah, I mean, I would have to agree. Uh, I would say that the criteria that that Muslim randomly pulled out, um, I mean, basically they pulled them out because they were things that all but the, a couple of them were things that every human being is true of every human being, it, almost or almost every human being, except not Jesus, because there are unique attributes that make him special, like, you know, mm -hmm. not being born of a woman, for example. Um, or they're things that just about every political leader would fulfill. You know, fighting your enemies, bringing laws, that's basically the same thing as being a political leader for the most part. And exactly. they're things that basically every claimed prophet would fulfill as well. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. basically they, they clearly cherry-picked those criteria not to fit, fit Muhammad. They picked them mm -hmm. to rule out Jesus. That was their only real goal there. Jesus. Absolutely. Um, so I've come up with a list of criteria that is very unique to the life of Moses. And then maybe we can compare and see if Muhammad meets a more unique criteria that we should be taking into consideration, right? So clearly it's bad criteria if it's Napoleon and Joseph Smith that it could fit and probably millions of other political leaders. Something unique to Moses' life was he was a childhood genocide survivor. Uh, something very unique to Moses was that he he met God, spoke to God audibly, met him uh, face to face. Uh, Moses performed several, several miracles. Moses is an actual brethren in the bloodline of, of Israel. He led people, right, lots of people out of bondage and slavery. He did deliver laws to Israel. He is also in the successions of prophetic blessings promised by Yahweh, which we can pause and talk about that a little bit, Thaddeus. So there's there's a very specific way in which the blessing is passed um, from like Abraham through the rest of basically the rest of the prophets here, right? At least in the in the first five books. So how how is the, how is this passed down? How is 
how was the blessing passed? Let's start with with Abraham. How did he pass on his blessing? Uh, I mean, explicitly. <laughs> I, I, I'm not quite sure what you're looking for, but okay. So uh, Abraham explicitly is told that your blessing, right, will not pass through a particular individual, but it will pass through this other particular individual. Can okay. You, can you name those two individuals for me? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, okay. Of, uh, of course, uh, it does not go through Ishmael. Interestingly mm -hmm. enough, and it does go through Isaac. Right. So, so the covenantal blessing goes through one son of the father of whoever their father is. Right. And the same thing happens. So Isaac is blessed by Abraham and then, uh, Jacob, and there's a long story. I'm not going to get into it. Jacob is blessed by Isaac and so on and so forth, right? So, so the blessing, the covenantal blessing is going to be through Jacob, right? So Jacob is really the final one here because all the descendants of Jacob are going to be blessed. He is the one with, with the, the 12 sons, right? Who are the 12 tribes of Israel. Um, so the actual blessing goes through him. Now, Ishmael does receive a blessing, right? But it's not a prophetic blessing blessing. It, it's, it's not a blessing that the God's covenant is going to be with them or through them. It's just a general blessing because Ishmael is a son of Abraham, right? Understand yes. that, and, right? Uh, okay. Of course, Muslims will refer to that text and the, they'll say that um, Ishmael was blessed and he was told that he would, uh, you know, father a great nation or whatever. Mm -hmm. what, the, what they don't tell us is that the text talks about it being fulfilled <laughs> that it, it's fulfilled within his own lifetime it's not it is a prophecy to him but it's not a prophecy to any later generation it's fulfilled within his own lifetime hmm. that seems problematic but let's ignore that okay that is we're just gonna keep ignoring facts not important for the discussion um so moving on to the next point here, delivered messages in the name of Yahweh, right? And has no failed prophecies. This is, this is the criteria that is very unique to Moses, that is very unique to the passage at hand in, in which we are coming up with, right? So uh, yeah, before, at best, quick, yeah, go real ahead. quickly, before you go on, um, is there one of those criteria on your list that the text makes explicit in... Uh, kind of the farewell message of Moses uh, as to what the people were looking for as a prophet like Moses. Um, I'm not sure where you're going to go with this, but the first thing that comes to mind is um, there has never been a prophet to this day that has arisen in Israel like Moses. Is that where you're going with it? Yeah, yeah. So that passage. Okay. Right. Because a lot of people are going to say, uh, if they don't know that passage, you're going to say, well, um, Joshua seems to be that that. Person, right, right, which is the the some Jewish people would say that it, it is unfulfilled and it's about the future Messiah, but the most common mm -hmm. Jewish interpretation is that Joshua fulfilled this. Um, right, but that that passage specifically says that there's not hasn't been a prophet to arise like Moses, who knew God face to face. Mm, yes. Okay. I see where you're going with it. Yeah, I think it a, also mentions the working, one. the miracles, but I was specifically referring to the face-to-face, -face, mm. as in this is the most important criteria. Correct. All right, so we're going to move into that, right? But let's uh, of all that list, right? We can basically Muhammad none of that, except for one thing. We can make a little bit of an argument for Muhammad led people with hurt feelings away from a town full of bullies. So that's kind of like. Moses leading his enslaved nation out of horrible bondage and into the promised land that they were promised for an inheritance for the last 400 some odd years. Um, it's kind of the same. Uh, and Pharaoh tried to kill them and do all these kinds of crazy stuff. But, you know, if, if, if it's just the general idea of somebody bullied me and I had my feelings hurt, so I ran away is the same thing as escaping uh, abject slavery um, back to your homeland then I guess we could say that Muhammad is a little bit like Moses. Uh, but that's if, if that's the best that they can do, I don't, I don't really... Yeah, and I've never know. heard a, a Muslim make that argument. It's always... Well, it's usually... Uh, if, if you can say it's Jesus, you can say it's Muhammad. <laughs> that's what they usually mm -hmm. do. And if they try to make something a little more specific, it'll be just like that first list that Muhammad got married. 
just like ninety <laughs> percent of humans and and in, in human history, and Jesus didn't. Therefore, it is Muhammad. Right. No. Exactly. Sorry, my earbud earbud fell out there for a second. Uh, yeah, you're right. That's exactly. They try to just. It, it's it's a two quo quay. It's a it's a false dichotomy. They try to just exclude jesus so therefore the only option you yeah because is, you know this argument that you have here that would be more of like trying to make a christian type argument you know mm -hmm. like actually respecting the text and and trying to find unique ways that they're connected and right. uh you know muslims their, their scripture doesn't understand biblical typology and they certainly don't understand it um so you're you're making a better argument than they do is what I'm trying to say. No, I'm 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 trying my best. I'm trying to be as charitable as possible. Um, sorry, I'm just saying. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm trying to be as charitable as possible to the Muslims. I'm trying to help them out, right? Because if if we really are going to have Muslims watch this video and say, you know what, um, Muhammad's just not in Deuteronomy eighteen eighteen. He's just not. We we need to do our very very best to address from every possible angle what their argument might be right so that's why i'm trying to be charitable i'm trying to you know we kind of joke and sarcastic and a little bit mockery or whatever but we're, we're we're trying to address it from every possible angle so that they don't have anywhere else to go except for the do the easiest thing which is to say you know what you're right muhammad is not actually a prophet like moses not according to this verse yeah no tearing down straw men here we're, we're strengthening their argument rather than mm -hmm. making it as weak as possible Yep, we are trying to steel man their position a, as best as possible. And we also have the stream open for Muslims to come up. If we messed up something or uh, they have another angle in which we have not addressed, we want to hear from you. We want to have a discussion and a dialogue with you. And and uh, we, will, we will let the chips fall where they may. We'll let the cream rise to the top, so to speak. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give us a list here, Thaddeus. Um, would you mind, actually, would you mind reading it for me? Sure, I can do that. How Actually, Mo let me read the title, and then you can oh. read all the descriptions. Here. I was about How to read Muhammad the title. How Muhammad is like Gosh. Moses. <laughs> yeah. So, so go ahead and tell me all the ways you see on your screen that Muhammad is like Moses. Uh, well, unless you forgot to advance the slide, I'm not seeing anything. Oh. Yeah, no, I wrote it like that on purpose. <laughs> so, I figured you did. I figured they're, you They're did. literally, guys... <laughs> We, we went through this, and, and Christians, you can help us out. Like, may, maybe we missed something uh, in this slide, but there's, I can't, I honestly can't find a single way, meaningful way, uh, that, that Muhammad is like Moses. I can literally find no meaningful criteria in which I would think that part, partially, he would be like Moses, or fully, he would be like Moses, or anything like that. I honestly can't find it. Yeah. Um, it, um, I don't know. Um, led a spiritually blind people? Say what? <laughs> I, I said that he was the, the leader of a, a spiritually blind people, or a, or maybe uh, better put, a, okay. a, a stubborn, rebellious people. Stubborn and stiff-necked people. Okay, yeah, that that might be a good that that might be a good criteria. Maybe we'll do a bonus video on that, unless you have an immediate <laughs> reputation of it, Thaddeus. But that's good. I think that would be a good a, a better argument. Um, for him, I think to say, look, he he led uh, stubborn and re rebellious people. I think that's great. That, that's a fantastic one. Uh, we'll we'll ignore the rest of the criteria that <laughs> rejects him, but uh, we'll at least keep we'll hold on to that one and and shove all the other ones under the rug. All right. Sound, sound like a plan yep, to you? Yep. So we have that, <laughs> and we have some very trivial criteria, and now mm -hmm. we'll see. So that that's the Muhammad side. Now we have to compare that to other arguments. Um, and of course, mm -hmm. since we're Christians, we'll look at the Christian argument here and see how much more or less uh, Jesus is like Moses. Yeah. Um, so Jesus is like Moses. And we can, and I, I can say this because my Bible says this as well. Muhammad can't necessarily say this, right? I know the Quran 7, 157, so you can find him described in there. Um, but Jesus says it a lot more eloquently. He says it a lot more specifically. He says, for if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. 
So let's see. Actually, before you go on, um, yeah. it, it, this is an aside, but it occurred to me when you were saying that. Of course, if you actually read the Quran in context, 7157 is addressed to Moses. So mm -hmm. Moses is being told that uh, he should see the messenger written in his Torah and his gospel. Uh, very interesting then <laughs> that, that Moses yeah. apparently had access to the gospel. Yep, yep, yep. So yeah, it, there, there's a couple of different angles that you can take. This I've heard a lot of people with, with those angles. Again, for me, I try to be as charitable as possible on yeah, face value. Just a little aside Muslims. there that that Moses should be able to recognize Muhammad in mm -hmm. the the Bible, apparently. Yeah, but apparently, according to Jesus, Moses Moses recognized Jesus because Moses wrote about him. So let's let's use the criteria that we talked about earlier, the more meaningful criteria, right? And some of this you can just say whatever, but um, both Jesus and Moses were child genocide survivors. They both met God face to face, spoke to God face to face on a mountain, by the way, that's kind of a little addition there. They both performed miracles. They are brethren because in their bloodline, they are actual Israelites. Um, Moses led people out of bondage and slavery, and Jesus did this on a much more spiritual and permanent level. They both delivered laws to Israel on a mountain, right? And a lot of Muslims are going to argue with this. Well, Jesus didn't give any new laws. First of all, Jesus says, a new commandment I give to you. <laughs> gives a new commandment. Uh, but also, when he was on a mountain, known as the Sermon on the Mount, he gave laws, expanded upon laws, fulfilled laws, right? So he was actually giving laws in those sense, in, in, in that sense as well. He is, uh, Jesus is personally in the succession of blessings promised by Yahweh. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah, where the scepter of rulership shall not depart. He is from the tribe of Judah. He is the Messiah. He is an Israelite. Right, so he's personally in the succession of blessings, which came through Jacob, who is Israel, and the 12 tribes of Israel. It has to be that particular way. Jesus, as we mentioned, delivered messages in the name of Yahweh. Jesus has no failed prophecies. He ascended to a mountain with three disciples, like Moses did, and they heard the voice of God and here's a kind of a fun aside a little bit with the child genocide survivor um the israelites because of a drought went to egypt and they came back with moses right uh jesus when he was taken away uh when he survived the child genocide he went to egypt and he returned back to the promised land just like the israelites went away from the promised land to egypt and came back but any way you splice it jesus fulfills this criteria and he fulfills it well now thaddeus would you like to add anything to this list that i missed uh well you kind of alluded to it um with the uh, transfiguration you didn't explicitly use that term of course but you you talked about him uh, you know going up uh, the mountain with three disciples what mm -hmm. you didn't say there however is that he radiated the divine glory, mm, which yes. uh, is, is a crucial comparison in in the opinion of the New Testament. That what Moses had that was only temporary, that uh, you know Moses would radiate the divine glory temporarily after talking mm -hmm. with God, uh, that Jesus has permanently by nature. And of course, there's no conception yes. of that at all in Islam. And that's why you're here, Thaddeus. Thank you, sir. No, that's a fantastically perfect point. I alluded to it, but I didn't include that detail. Thank you, sir, for doing so. We're just strengthening the case that the prophet, like Moses, is in fact Jesus. All right. So uh, if the audience wants to participate in this, if anybody wants to call Thaddeus, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a chance for, for your particular conclusions, my conclusion, at least by researching this, is that Muhammad is not in any way, shape, or form the prophet like Moses. And in fact, he is a false prophet delivering false revelations from a false god. And according to the 
verse and the surrounding verses in the context that Mohammedans lead us to, Muhammad should have actually been put to death under the Israelite law. However, we just noticed that in a meaningful criteria, Jesus does actually fulfill the prophecy and the criteria of being a prophet like Moses. So I don't know if you want to add anything to that. I'll get into my final conclusion here, and then we can open up for... Yeah, well, I mean, I basically, of course, have the same conclusion that, well, you know, abundantly obvious that Muhammad doesn't have any real claim to be like Moses. And, of course, Jesus has some pretty strong claims word all right so moving moving on to kind of the final thing and like i said if, if you want to share your link thaddeus and any muslims want to come up and and have a discussion if you have time for it i've, I've got some time we can do that yep i'll go um, ahead and post the link um go ahead and share your thoughts yeah for sure so the the question here is if, if you're muslim you're watching this how should you react to this right so you you can actually go ahead and, and uh, affirm this is no this is this does not take you out of Islam. You can affirm that Jesus is in fact the prophet like Moses who fulfilled that prophecy, right? Because you also hold a, what I believe to be a counterfeit Jesus, but let's lay that aside. You also hold that he was a prophet and he fulfilled prophecies and that he is the Messiah. So there's nothing wrong with you just looking at the evidence of Deuteronomy 18:18, 18, 18, looking at the entirety of the biblical text looking at how it couldn't possibly be about an, an, an Arab prophet, um, and just go, you know what? Jesus does fulfill this. Muhammad does not fulfill this, but it doesn't necessarily mean that Muhammad is a false prophet, right? Because the, the, the Surah 7, Ayah 157 necessitates that Muhammad is found in our scriptures, but it, it, all you need to do is to be able to find him in, in two locations, one in the Torah and the other one in the Injil or in the gospel. That's what your specific text says. So if you can find Muhammad twice, once in the Old Testament, I'll even give you the Old Testament, even though it literally says Torah or the law, which is the first five books, or in the gospels. Uh, so you've got a lot more chances here. Okay, so let's just cross that one off the list, Muslims. This one's just not, not for you. Uh, we're going to move on. We're going to go through some other ones here in the future. So my best advice is to, as Dory says in uh, Finding Dory or Finding Nemo, I can't remember which one, just keep swimming or just keep searching, just keep searching, right? However, if we get through this entire series and you don't find Muhammad, then that necessitates, if you're going to be intellectually honest, that you reject him as a prophet you conclude that the Quran is therefore wrong, which means that the Quran is not from an all-knowing God, and that means that Muhammad delivered false revelation, and unfortunately, you've been following a false religion. Okay, But don't, don't think of that as being a bad thing. Think of learning about that as being a good thing, because that sets you free from having false beliefs and then allows you to pursue more true beliefs. So that's what that's what I hope this series does, and that's what I hope you're able to conclude today, that it's not Muhammad, it is Jesus. Uh, but you can hold on to a little bit of hope that you can maintain your your faith if you can find Muhammad in, in the scriptures. But then again, that is, if they do find Muhammad in the scriptures, that affirms our scriptures, and our scriptures go directly in contradiction with what the Quran says, and if they're both written from the same God, like the Quran says, then that means that they're contradictory. So it couldn't possibly be from God. I don't yeah. know. Whatever bit, Muslims, bit of a you, dilemma you can figure there. A bit of a dilemma. Yeah. Pretty, pretty rough stuff. So I think that's it. That's the end of my slideshow.